Welcome to the show. I'm Chris Smiley. Glad to be back in studio. Um, took a short vacation to visit some of my family for the holidays. Uh, I had really had a good time. I got to see my parents and uh, my sister, who uh, live in South Florida. But glad to be back on the air, Afghanistan TV, to talk to you about uh, some really important issues. Um, if you haven't seen any of my previous shows, I'm a documentary filmmaker. Uh, I do activism work. Uh, my films cover political interest stories, public interest stories. I try to create things to uh, educate and enlighten the public, to help people understand uh, the truth about uh, our political atmosphere here so that we can uh, fight for social justice, so we can understand how we need to proceed about things, how we need to vote, what we need to do. Um, it's hard to make decisions about what we should do if we don't understand the complete history. Film is a very powerful tool for us to use. Um, so, uh, you can check out my website, chrismileymedia.com. I just came out with a short documentary called Disneyland of War. Uh, this short film talks about uh, the glorification of war and violence in American culture. It's a very important piece uh, that'll show you how uh, the military is recruiting children and also uh, teaching children to accept war as something that is fun. And uh, we went down to the San Diego uh, Miramar uh, Air Show base where they put on this military show and. It's a huge event and something that happens in many bases across the country in many cities where uh, <clears throat> I guess oh, okay we're good with sound uh, so you can check out my short documentary I just posted it on my website um, there's a link to it on the YouTube there Disneyland of War uh, something I'm very proud to present to you so please check it out um, I'm also working on a feature-length documentary about the war in Afghanistan and that's something that I'll be talking to you about the next few weeks. Uh, what I've learned, what I've uncovered, um, some very illuminating and very surprising things that, uh, that I'm glad to share with you and that'll help, help make sense of what's going on, why it's happened. Um, you don't have any sound on Facebook. We're, we're down on Facebook. On Facebook you don't have any sound. Mm -hmm. Jadu's okay? Jadu's okay, but Facebook. Because mm, okay. everybody's writing no sound, no sound. No sound. Um, okay, maybe uh, restart the Facebook stream. So we're just having some technical difficulties with Facebook. We're going to try to get that back up for you. <clears throat> I'll let Sajia take care of that. Um, so let's give her a second just to uh, get us back on live with Facebook. Uh, for those of you watching on Jadu, um, glad to have you with us. Um, just give us a moment so we can get this uh, Facebook feed going again. How come you don't have any sound? It, it could just be some people having technical difficulties on Facebook. <laughs> So for those of you listening on Jadu, um, okay, just start all over again. Okay. <laughs> Hopefully we're back on Facebook. Uh, okay. Um, as I was saying, um, I'm a documentary filmmaker. Uh, I've just come out with a short uh, film, Disneyland of War, which you can check out on my website, chrismileymedia.com. This short film talks about the glorification of warfare in American culture. Um, it's a very important piece to try to understand what happens in this country, how people are apathetic towards war or support warfare. Um, I think we're good on Facebook. Thank you, Sajid. Um, so this short film is, is very important uh, to check out so you can see you know, how, how warfare is uh, accepted in American culture, why we have so many of these crazy wars that we just don't understand. A lot of it has to do with how uh, Americans view warfare and how we're recruited as at a very young age to think that uh, violence and war are, are, are ways to solve problems. So check that out. Also, I'll be coming out soon with uh, my feature film on the war in Afghanistan. And that's something that I'm going to be talking to you about periodically uh, over the next few weeks. Uh, some really uh, enlightening and illuminating truths that I've uncovered and things that need to be known to understand why this war happened and why it was unjustified. Um, so today's show, you know, I really wanted to get into 
talking about you know some very interesting things I found out about Al Qaeda, the Taliban, things that will really put things in perspective. But before I can even get into certain things like that, we have to understand the context, the political context. We have to understand the complete history uh, of the United States, Afghanistan, the region, and how these cer certain things can come to happen. So, you know, before we can, let me just get this quick call. Afghanistan TV. Okay. Okay. I'll take phone calls in a couple minutes. Let me just inter introduce you to this uh, subject we're going to talk about today. So, um, before we can get into uh, some of the things that uh, happen, some of these very specific points and uh, documents and information that I've uncovered that will really shed light on this war, we have to understand kind of the, the background story. Um, you know, if you're watching the television news, you might be very confused as to the different narratives going on, the different perspectives, and it, it can all seem very confusing. And it's confusing because there's a lot of lies that are being spread, a lot of untruths that are just being perpetuated. Um, you know, there's this, uh, this really strong narrative pushed by uh, the United States government that there's this battle of good versus evil, of free America versus crazy terrorists. And this is a very dangerous idea. This is a very prevalent idea that, you know, the reason why we get in so many conflicts is because all of our enemies happen to be crazy. They, you know, they wake up one day and they, you know, they just hate America for, because we're a good country, because we have freedoms. Just some of these ideas, you know, that are just so prevalent but don't really make sense, you know. Um, our government has used uh, uh, these uh, lies, they've used certain events to try to twist the truth about what's happening because unfortunately uh, our country, like so many other countries, are corrupted uh, beyond belief. Our politicians, our government officials are completely corrupted to serve a particular interest, business interests. And you know, what they have to do is mask the truth about what they're doing because the American public would not accept some of these horrific things that are happening if they knew the real truth about it. So they have to spin these uh, stories and uh, put out these lies that don't really make sense um, but are still accepted by the public. Um, so what, what we'll be able to talk about is um, you know this, this background story about why it's happening. So you know when 9-11 happened there was this uh, a uh, really quick uh, push by uh, George W. Bush and, and members of our government to say that, you know, that America is this great nation, this uh, this nation nation of ours that was attacked unjustifiably, and that these uh, terrorists um, had absolutely no good reason to do what they do. They were evil, um, and and they didn't really answer the real questions that needed to be answered about why this happened. Is there some reason, you know, that, that they have that could be justified, even though their tactics of violence are not justified? Is the reason they're all getting together to do these sorts of things justified? Is there something the United States government is doing that could be influencing these people to fly planes into buildings, to kill themselves? I mean, I don't think people just would do that for no reason. So let me play a quick clip from uh, my film, and uh, I think this will shed some light on uh, what was happening back in uh, September of 2001. What happened on September 11th was a huge crime. It was a crime against humanity. The idea of blowing up buildings, blowing up airliners, killing almost 3,000 people at one time on you know one occasion, it was a horrific crime. I can remember right after September 11th happened, um, you know, listening very carefully to the discussions going on there. And one of the most interesting things that happened in that period is that there, initially people were saying, you know, there was this question of why are we being attacked? I have a report here that uh, Osama bin Laden, who is often identified as the world's leading terrorist, warned three weeks ago that he and his followers would carry out an unprecedented attack on U.S. interests for its support of Israel and Arab journalists with access said to him Tuesday in London. So initially, uh, some people were raising the question about, well, you know, are there things about our foreign policy that have something to do with this? Right. Um, but those kinds of questions were very quickly pushed off the agenda. And there's this um, and there's this kind of narrative about, well, there's the Islamic radicals who hate our 
our way of life. Americans are asking, why do they hate us? They hate what they see right here in this chamber, a democratically elected government. Their leaders are self-appointed. They hate our freedoms, our freedom of religion, our freedom of speech, our freedom to vote and assemble and disagree with each other. So, you know, really, they hate freedom? Is, is that what we're really supposed to believe, that there's people out there that hate freedom? I mean, you know, even the most uh, evil of people out there, you know, I'm sure there are some people that, that want to control things and do certain things, but to think that thousands of people are uh, protesting and rising up and joining groups like Al-Qaeda because they hate freedom, is it just doesn't make sense, you know? Um, and it's not supposed to make sense because it's not true. Um, you know, this is, this is a, a continuous lie that's always perpetuated um, by our government to, uh, to justify warfare, to justify certain policies. They have to, we have to demonize enemies if we want people to go to war. We have to characterize people as inhuman if we want to send people over there to, to kill and be killed. You know, we have to create this image of a, of a horrible enemy with absolutely no uh, justice if we're going to go out there and do these sorts of things. So, you know, around 9-11, initially you saw there were a few reporters that were questioning, uh, okay, well, you know, why, why were they doing this? What happened? But, you know, very quickly this, uh, this narrative of the evil terrorists versus the free world was pushed really hard. And, you know, this is not, like I was saying, this is not something new. This is not something that was just concocted by George Bush. This is not something that's just concocted by Republicans. This is something that's been throughout American history. I mean, it's, it's, no, uh, it's no mystery that politics is corrupt and it has been forever. So this shouldn't be such a foreign concept. And America is no different than any other country where we've had people abuse our government, abuse our military, use it for, for things that are they're not good for the public and that are for their own personal benefit. Um, so I'm going to cut to uh, another clip here just to kind of show you how, you know, this is something uh, that can be dated back to the beginning of America. And here we're going to watch a clip from uh, former President Bill Clinton saying the same sorts of things that you're hearing from President Bush to President Obama. America is and will remain a target of terrorists precisely because we are leaders, because we act to advance peace, democracy, and basic human values, because we're the most open society on earth and because, as we have shown yet again, we take an uncompromising stand against terrorism. So, you know, as you can see, you know, this is a, this is a story that's been spinning out there for a long time here in this country, and it just doesn't make sense, you know, for us to believe that, you know, these people are just completely crazy, have no reasons to do what they do. And, and if you actually look at it just for a second, if you actually go and investigate for yourself just for one second, you'll see this is a complete lie. But unfortunately, you know, most people don't have the time and resources to go research these sorts of things. They rely on uh, media, they rely on the word spoken from our government officials, and they don't get a chance to hear what bin Laden was actually saying. They don't get a chance to actually hear what Al-Qaeda is saying. And you know, as repulsive as that may be to, to sit and listen to the rhetoric of a terrorist organization, we need to know why they're doing this. We need to know what's going on if we want to solve this problem. If we just accept these uh, lies or just accept what other people tell us, you know, we're not going to understand what's happening. We're not going to be able to change anything if we're operating off of something that's not true. Um, so, you know, bin Laden's been very clear from the beginning about why he did what he did. He's been... Uh, He's said this continuously in, in his uh, speeches that he puts out, but we never actually get to hear that most of the time on our, our uh, media here in the United States. Uh, so let me play real quick, you know, what bin Laden actually did say. What are his actual reasons? He had three principal issues. One was to remove the U.S. military presence from Saudi Arabia. The other was to end the U.S. support of Israel, uh, particularly 
as it affected negatively the Palestinians, and three was, at that time, an immediate halt to the bombing of Iraq, and even still now today. Uh, an end to sanctions that he felt um, adversely affected Iraqi women and children and 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 innocents. We declared a jihad, a holy war, against the United States government because it is unjust, criminal, and tyrannical. Uh, it's a David and Goliath scenario. So we'll cut it there. Uh, so we have a caller with a question. Uh, sir, you're live on Afghanistan TV. What's your name? Uh, my name is Safi. How are you, Chris? Good. Thank you for calling in. Uh, as, as an Afghan, I love you. You are telling the truth about your government. Uh, can you tell us when the U.S. Uh, will leave Afghanistan? Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Well, thank you for your, your call and your question. Uh, this, this gentleman wants to know when the United States will leave Afghanistan. Um, well, if you listen to what our government is saying, you know, we're supposed to be leaving years ago, or that the war was over, that we were leaving. Um, but I don't think the United States will be leaving anytime soon, and of course this is a really uh, irrational decision and, and a catastrophic decision for the country of Afghanistan. Uh, as long as the United States military is there with the presence, as long as they're uh, have these bases and are supporting military operations of the Afghan National Army, there's going to be continued warfare. The Taliban has been also very clear, just like Al-Qaeda has been clear in their demands and in, in their ideology of what they believe in and what they believe is uh, they want Afghanistan independent of foreign occupation, they want Afghanistan independent of foreign influence. So until that happens, this war is going to continue, and I don't see that changing anytime soon. The United States has what we're going to get into later has a long history of uh, manipulating the politics of other nations of invading other nations of crafting other countries to behave in a way that is beneficial to the united states and you know this uh our, our politicians and our government has gone through great lengths and horrific lengths to achieve these means you know millions and millions of people have died for political causes that are just unjustified uh, numerous wars. We'll, we'll get into some of the history of, a, of the United States um, that needs to be understood. Um, thank you for your call, sir. Um, so I'm going to play this clip uh, that you really have to see. This, this was just so telling of this dichotomy that's out there, this two-sided narrative that's out there of people who believe that Al-Qaeda are these crazy terrorists, uh, they're just doing this, you know, for religious reasons, or they're just doing this because they hate people that are good, which of course, I mean, makes no sense, versus the other side of people believing, no, well, they're saying that, you know, Al-Qaeda is attacking because of United States aggression in the Middle East, United States uh, assassination attempts, uh, wars with other nations. So you have these two uh, sides going at each other, and in this presidential debate uh, earlier in, in 2000, uh, Rick Santorum and, and Ron Paul had a little back and forth. And watch very carefully of how the American public responds. Watch how the American public responds to this and what they believe is true. It, it's very telling. So let me play this clip real quick. We are not being attacked, and we were not attacked, because of our actions. We were attacked, as Newt talked about, because we have a, we have a, a civilization that is antithetical to the civilization of the jihadists and they want to kill us because of who we are and what we stand for. And we stand for American exceptionalism. We stand for freedom and opportunity for everybody around the world. And I am not ashamed to do that. 30 seconds, uh, Mr. Paul. As long as this country follows that idea, we're going to be under a lot of, a lot of danger. This whole idea that the whole Muslim world is responsible for this and they're attacking us because we're free and prosperous, that is just not true. Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda have been explicit. They have been explicit and they wrote and said that we attacked, we attacked America because you had bases on our holy land in Saudi Arabia. You do not give Palestinians a fair treatment and you have been bombing. I didn't say that. I'm, I'm trying to get you to understand what the motive was behind the bombing. At the same time, we had been bombing and killing hundreds of thousands of Iraqis for 10 years. Would you be annoyed? If you're not annoyed, you, then there's some problem. Right. 
just really unreal very very telling piece uh i mean i don't think there's anything that's uh gives a better depiction of of the problem we have here in the united states where people believe uh this this lie of everyone that the united states attacks are crazy every enemy of the united states has no reason to take arms against the united states or to uh, it's just it's very very hard to to sit and watch how the american public responds when they're presented right there versus the truth and and the lie and the truth making so much more sense than this this wild lie um so i think that was from the 2008 presidential debate uh ron paul and rick santorum republicans um debating um so we're going to cut here to uh, another quick clip um so what we're going to talk about is um you know this this history of of the united states and uh why this is so important for us to, to understand. If we're going to understand the context of the, the war in Afghanistan, if we're going to understand uh, how we should expect things to change. Um, so let's cut here to this uh, clip with pre former President uh, Bill Clinton. I want to reiterate. The United States wants peace, not conflict. We want to lift lives around the world not take them. We have worked for peace in Bosnia, in Northern Ireland, in Haiti, in the Middle East, and elsewhere. So that was for former President Bill Clinton. And uh, well, I, I'll just tell you that's a complete lie, what he just said. I mean, it, for him to say that we've worked for peace in the Middle East and Haiti, I mean, very random that he said Haiti. Um, I think he might have brought up Haiti because most Americans and most of the world doesn't know about U.S. involvement in Haiti, but I do and a lot of other people do know that the United States has invaded Haiti. We've meddled in their political affairs. We've the CIA, the CIA has funded coups to remove uh, leaders that we didn't like. Uh, long history of the United States uh, forcing Haiti to act in a way that we want them to act. Um, and for him to say that we've worked for peace in the Middle East is just unreal. Even, even during his his time, um, you know, most uh, most Americans aren't, aren't aware of a lot of the little uh, conflicts and the the more indirect uh, ways that the United States has uh, uh, acted in the Middle East and, and done some really horrible things. Um, but what what we need to understand is that you know this is not this is not America that's doing this. this is not me, my neighbors, my friends. Most of the American public doesn't know about these things that are going on, they don't understand it. Um, there's a select few people, a select elite group of people that manipulate our government, they use our military to carry out certain things that will benefit them. And, you know, it's a business decision. The United States is uh, essentially a large business, right? We have uh, a capitalist economy, we have businesses that fund elections, they pour tons and tons of money into uh, PR into elections to get what they want, to get things that will support their businesses. And some of our largest businesses here are the uh, military contractors, the military weaponries. Uh, we sell billions of dollars worth of weapons around the world. Um, and and it, what it's led to is uh, this imperialist uh, direction that the United States has taken for a long time now. Um, Colonialism, imperialism is not anything new. This is something that so many countries have uh, done around the world. And what's ironic is that America was a colony that uh, rose up in a revolution and it itself became a colonizer of other nations. So uh, pure irony there, but when you look back at the history of the United States, you will see uh, this, this imperialism, meaning that we go to other countries, we colonize other countries, we colonize other lands, we, um, we use our military force to remove uh, leadership that's not friendly to American capitalism. Uh, something recently that just happened in, in uh, the news is uh, the opening up of uh, relations with Cuba. Cuba, under Castro, a, a communist-like government, I'm not going to say it's pure communist, but a communist-like government, and 
you know, it wasn't that the Cuba was in, uh, so much different than any other country uh, with their human rights issues, but the fact that they weren't open up to American businesses, the fact that they were spreading this idea of, of communism and, and uh, sharing of resources and sharing of the commons, uh, that was a very dangerous thing for the United States, uh, the spreading of that idea. And also, it was just a negative to have this country that wasn't open to American business, especially when it's so close to our shores. We wanted that open. Businesses want to make money off of other countries. Um, so uh, one gentleman I, I interviewed is uh, William Bloom. Uh, that's B-L-U-M. I invite you to check out some of his work. Uh, what I'm going to show you is a quick clip. Uh, I got a chance to interview him. He's written a number of books about um, American imperialism uh, and colonialism. And uh, he, he actually has a, 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 a master list he's created of all the different countries the United States has uh, intervened with. And uh, it's it's quite shocking when you read. It's a, it's a great introduction if uh, if you read some of his books into some of these uh, topics that might be a little complicated. But he get, he presents it in a very uh, easy way to understand. Uh, so let me play you a quick clip here. Yeah, well, uh, the U.S. interventions have been going on for for well over a century, uh, and it's especially since the end of the Second World War, I have compiled lists showing that since the end of the Second World War, the U.S. government has attempted to overthrow more than 50 foreign governments. They've attempted to assassinate more than 50 foreign leaders. They have bombed the people of more than 30 countries. They have seriously interfered in the elections in more than 30 countries. And they have suppressed at least 20 um, revolutions, or attempts at a revolution. That's, I, have, I have all these lists in, in my writings, uh, these master lists, uh, which amaze even me. So that was William Bloom. Uh, he's written a number of books on the subject. Uh, a great writer, and I... I uh, advise you to go check out some of his books and uh, his website which will have this long list of nations that the United States has intervened with um, you know what 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 people have done under the cover of our government um, is horrific uh, millions of people have been killed both foreign and American you know our government like many others has been infiltrated by people that don't have the public's best interests and it's really quite sad. Something I also wanted to mention is if you have any questions, you can also message uh, under the Facebook video if you're on Facebook, and I'll be able to uh, check those questions out and answer them as well. <clears throat> um, you know, somehow our politicians have been able to successfully lie to the public about what has happened and what they're doing. Um, you know, they, they hide behind uh, the flag, they hide behind America uh, in doing what they do. Uh, make no mistake about it, you know, just because you're an elected representative doesn't make you uh, representative of the entire country. Uh, our elections here are completely controlled by big money interests. It's very hard for the public to have a true representative of their interests. And, you know, Unfortunately, this is our, our state uh, that we live in right now. But it's important for us to understand this history because you know if we want to get into uh, why Al-Qaeda is doing what they're doing, why ISIS is doing what they're doing, why there's this conflict and bloodshed, you know, we have to understand the complete history. Um, let me cut to another clip from uh, William Bloom. I think George W. Bush and Rumsfeld and uh, Cheney and, and a few others of, of their ilk, they are, they could be called uh, sociopaths. Uh, they, they, not, they're not bothered at all by the immense suffering. What, what, what the U.S. government did to the people in the land of Iraq is close to the worst thing in, in all of history. Any, one country has done to another. I, I've summarized this. In, 
it's just incredible what we do, what we do to us. We, we took an, an educated, modern people with, with a, a welfare state, not bothering anybody else, and just reduced it to an abject, failed state. It just. I mean, Iraq is uh, the Iraq War is something that I think most. People, most Americans, most American politicians now will admit was a horrific, horrific event. Um, but it's just one of many, one of many, unfortunately. You know, uh, my parents grew up uh, in the Vietnam era, and Vietnam was just another complete, uh, another horror that had no justification. Uh, there was no reason for that aggression. I mean, when you think about it, we're talking about countries that are halfway around the world. Um, for us to say that we're doing something out of self-defense, you know, you, you better have a good reason for it. Somebody left a comment, you know, if there's all these lies, then who do we believe? Well, you need to, you need to believe, you need to read the information for your facts. I'm not telling you to believe me. I'm telling you to go research these, these uh, issues and get the full picture. Don't just rely on the information from our government. Hear what bin Laden was saying. Hear what the different sides are saying. Afghanistan TV. Hi, my name is Asma Popal. I'm a student at the University of Utah. I'm currently majoring in business and biology, and I really enjoyed your uh, show last time. I would like to thank you for showing the truth to the use of... Hello? Oh, I think we might have lost reception with uh, this caller. Uh, we'll try to call back and we'll, we'll take your question. Um, So, like I was saying, uh, you know, don't believe me. Research the facts for, your, for yourself. If you want my opinion on uh, certain publications and news outlets that I've found to be very, very good, uh, The Intercept, I think, is one of the best uh, journalistic outlets out there. Uh, that's The Intercept. Glenn Greenwald's a writer for them. They write uh, some of the best pieces I've ever uh, seen. I've never even come across something from them that was uh, questionable or uh, false. Um, so if you're looking for some good investigative stories, some good stories uh, about American politics, the Intercept is always a good choice. Um, <clears throat> so uh, like I was saying, uh, you know, my parents grew up with Vietnam. We've grown up with Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, and what I want to do is I want to change the narrative and to where the Afghanistan war is understood for what it is, and that's a complete horrific tragedy, an unjustified war, just as unjustified as Iraq and Vietnam, and some of these other uh, conflicts that we've gotten ourselves into. Um, so that's what I'm doing with uh, my documentary film. Um, that's what I hope to do with uh, this show and other outlets. Um, so if you have any questions, please feel free to call. You can also write me on Facebook. So let me play uh, something here from uh, Seymour Hersh. Uh, Seymour Hersh uncovered the My Lai Massacre in Vietnam. And uh, he's been, also if you're looking for uh, some news outlets, anything written by him is also very, very enlightening and informative. He bro he's broken some really huge stories. Uh, also the Abu Ghraib uh, prison story in uh, Iraq about the torture that was going on there. He's the one that broke that story as well. Let's listen to him for a second. Um, the notion that we are special seems to be, you know, pretty pretty dominant in America. You know, there's something, as I said, we even even Obama keeps on talking about. There's no country like the United States. Nobody is better. Nobody is greater. Nobody cares more about the world. I would argue nobody's killed more innocents in the last, you know, last four or five decades than, than the United States without giving a hoot. Okay, so we're back. Uh, we also have our previous caller who got cut off. Uh, welcome back to the show. Uh, go ahead. What was your question? Oh, sorry. Um, just quickly, I would like to thank you for showing the truth through the use of videos and documentaries and for making history clear to the next generation in the world. And I hope your show brings peace around the world as well. I would like, because I'm uh, currently learning about economy, what is the best solution, especially for the younger generation in Afghanistan, to utilize different like trades, uh, specifically in the arts as well as science, in order to help build up and boost the economy. Because I feel like I see a lot of things in the news, 
where they talk about how they need the economy to grow, but I don't really see anything happening, any kind of programs. Right. So her question is, thank you very much for your call. Uh, her question is, how can Afghans help their country? How can, what sort of skills can they pick up? What sorts of things can they do? Um, I think there's a real parallel between Afghanistan and the United States and many other countries. Um, you know, when you, when you go through school here in the United States, they don't teach you a lot of tangible skills. Uh, for example, me, I didn't learn film in school. I didn't even learn filmmaking in college. This was something that I had to pick up on my own. Oh, let's grab this call real quick. Afghanistan TV? Hello, Mr. Chris. Hello. Welcome to the show. I'm from London. You're calling from London. Awesome. What's your name? Yes. You're listening to me? His name is Kazi Said. Oh. Welcome to the show, sir. Go ahead. Do you have a My question? My name is Kazi Afghani from Afghanistan. Ah. in London. Okay. Welcome. Yes, my question. Look. Afghan Foundation cost six million liters of blood. What they achieved, they buried communism. They demolished the Berlin Wall. They, they give freedom to the Eastern European countries. What the Nazi government now, United States and NATO, do what is a donation to Afghanistan people? Corruption, Nazi, bloodshed, rubbish government in Afghanistan. Why you don't replace, replace this nonsense government in Afghanistan? No sense. Poor people didn't put in all the money. All the companies in the Afghan government so for the last 40 years, we are suffering. Hmm. What is your question, please, to me, a proper answer. Otherwise, I'm going to, in the high Park corner, in the next few days, and openly open my mouth against this bloody nonsense. United Nations and human rights and United Humanity International. Nothing. This is all bloodshed. Oh, anyhow, thank you so much. I'm very sorry. Can't explain and can't express what I mean to say. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, sir. Um, so he had a number of comments for us. Uh, we'll, we'll get right back to his comments. Let me first uh, finish answering. Um, Oh, oh, we're getting some more questions on Facebook no, as well. Having, yeah, I, I see it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so about uh, the young lady's question about what sorts of skills. You know, you're really going to have to rely upon yourself in many countries to pick up certain skills. You, the educational system in America here is supposedly one of the richest nations and uh, greatest countries in the world. Our education system is trash. It's absolute garbage. Actually, that's what I first started working in when I came out of college. I was working in education, education reform. I worked in the inner city schools in Los Angeles. And it was just so horrible on every level, from the bottom to the top, just nothing was right. And it was so hard to change anything that I decided to pull out of that. I decided to try to find a different way to influence uh, change. Because um, that's what I always, I've always wanted to do, is I want to do public interest work. I want to make things better for myself, my friends, my family in this country. And education is just so horrible in the United States that working in the system I didn't think was possible to make a change, so I've decided to step out and try to influence things on a larger scale, educate people on a larger scale through films, media. Um, so that's what I, I do now is I try to work on a much larger scale with uh, trying to influence change. Um, so the sort, But fortunately we live in a technological age. I picked up filmmaking, working with my friends and, and learning off of uh, the internet, YouTube, discussion boards. Uh, you can become a filmmaker. You can pick up certain technical skills. I learned how to build my own computer top to bottom. I built myself a really powerful machine to edit. I picked up cheap cameras uh, and, and was able to create really high quality productions. If you utilize the internet, you can pr uh, pick up skills. And an important skill uh, to pick up is media. Uh, you know, Now we have cell phones that will record and it's very important uh, if you're able to access a camera to, to record things that are happening to show and educate people what's going on. So if you can teach yourself how to uh, cut up a, a little video, you know, on your phone they have editing software, on your computer, helping with uh, independent media is so important because most of the big businesses of media are so corrupted. Um, Afghanistan TV, not one of those where we try to bring you <laughs> the most uh, truth we can. Um, as far as other technical skills to boost the economy, you know, I, it's so hard to say what to do because everything is so controlled. 
It's controlled in the United States. It's controlled in Afghanistan. How things develop. You know, we've had the technology in the United States for decades of electric cars, green energy, solar. It's been crushed. It's been crushed by oil businesses. It's been crushed by the lobbies. Uh, it's been crushed, these movements to produce clean energy. We have the technology. I remember seeing a great documentary, Who Killed the Electric Car? A great documentary that talked about some of these electric cars in the 90s that were running great and they were just completely uh, wiped out of competition because that doesn't benefit you know, some of these companies that are making tremendous amounts of money with oil. So if you can independently create solar technologies, if you can independently create things, you know, I'm all for it and I encourage you to, but you got to understand that you're going to encounter stiff uh, resistance because there's just uh, this huge structure to control and suppress things that don't benefit this elite group that has the power, that has the money currently. Um, that would be, you know, military and industrial complex, military uh, weaponry, big oil. These are the companies that own the wealth, and when you own the wealth, you own the power. Uh, so the other gentleman was talking about current state of politics in Afghanistan, um, the uh, uh, current regime. Uh, you know, this is something that's supported by the United States, and once the United States gets its hand in something, it's very hard uh, to, to, to get it to turn elsewhere. I mean, there's been so much bloodshed in Afghanistan, yet nothing has changed for the better. Um, so, you know, until, until some of these large forces uh, that are doing things that are not in the best interests of everyone pull out, until the United States pulls out, I don't think we're going to see the positive changes we need. That's why I said I try to work on a larger scale of things because I understand there's just these huge structures in place. If you can work on a smaller scale in your community and try to you know, pull yourself out of this, small scale efforts are being made here, Afghanistan, other countries where people are creating their own sustainability. They're creating hydroponic farms so they can grow their own food. They're creating little communities where they can be successful, they can live and thrive and not depend on these corrupt systems. So, you know, I encourage uh, the use of technology to pick up skills um, because a lot of us can't afford or have the abilities to make it to the university level but the information is out there, the, the education is out there. Um, one of our questions from online, without having a fight and American interference in Afghanistan, who would remove the Taliban? Well, something that I've always uh, referred to and, and believed is that it's something that has to be settled by Afghans. Um, I'm, not, I'm not the best educated person to tell you how Afghans can do this sort of thing. There's a lot more uh, educated Afghans who understand the culture a lot better than me. It's something I have been studying for years now, but not having grown up in Afghanistan. I mean, even many people that are Afghans and have grown up don't understand how to make this change. I mean, that's what some of the callers are asking about. Well, how do we make this change? You know, I don't have the answers for that, but I do know that it has to come from Afghans themselves. Um, the sort of culture that the Taliban embodies is something that's very strong and that's, uh, you know, picked up by a lot of people. There's a lot of people that join the Taliban, and there's a reason they do so. It's deeply rooted, and it could take a long time, but if there's peace, at least first, this is something that can be addressed. Cultural change does take time. Um, but, you know, the United States has advanced culturally. We, you know, it was only uh, last half century where, you know, black people were, uh, didn't have the right to vote. Um, you know, there's still oppression amongst uh, people of color in the United States, but at least it is progressing uh, in a positive direction. And I think there needs to be peace first in Afghanistan to do that. Somebody else has a, from Mr. Meyer. I think the answer how to improve Afghanistan Economics should be adults, children, and old should get on with their lives despite the war. Specialization, jacks of all trades, master of none. Exploit the natural resources, the mines, legalize and regulate some drugs. Train more fighters to be hired or employed by wealthy countries if needed. Well, there's some good points here. Um, like we were saying, if you can specialize and, and if you can get on uh, in your own communities without having to... Uh, be overcome by some of the conflict that's going on, you know, it's encouraged. But like I'm saying, I don't think there's any hope. 
I don't think there's any chance at peace and success for Afghanistan with the United States military presence with the United States involvement. You know, it's not just the military that's involved, it's the United States money, influence. I mean, we have a massive network of intelligence officers and resources that just use whatever they can to manipulate governments. Um, so that's something we'll get back to right now in discussing this history. Um, let me cut to uh, uh, Brian Wilson. Uh, he is uh, a Vietnam veteran, and I think uh, he has something that's important for us to hear. Well, I don't. I was only in Vietnam about uh, maybe two weeks before I was already. Uh, I was the first lieutenant, and I was already uh, thinking there's something really pretty awful that I was beginning to realize was happening. And then after the fifth week, uh, fifth or sixth week. I had already witnessed the bombings of five inhabited villages where everybody was killed with napalm. Seven, eight hundred Vietnamese, the mass majority of whom were children. And from that point on, I was irreversibly, um, I, I call it irreversible knowledge about the lie of the war and the lie of my country and the lie of my upbringing and the lie of everything. That was Brian Wilson, a former Vietnam uh, veteran. Uh, interesting to note uh, about uh, Brian Wilson. Uh, as you, I don't know if you could tell, but his legs, he lost the bottom half of his legs. And that was actually not from his time in Vietnam. Uh, it was from his time as an activist afterwards. Uh, Brian became a, a peace activist, uh, and he's also part of this organization I work with called Veterans for Peace. He uh, was protesting uh, the United States uh, supporting of uh, military uh, occupations and interventions uh, in Central America, South America. He went and laid down in front of a train that was carrying United States weapons uh, to support a, a bloody uh, military conflict. He laid down in front of this train and was, uh, the train did not stop for him and, and the protesters and he was fortunate to survive um, but he's a a great, uh, great man who's done a lot of great work for uh, peace and activism. He actually has a documentary out about his own life. Uh, I believe it's called The Story of Brian Wilson, but just check out Brian Wilson. He's a really cool man that uh, I was lucky to have met personally. Um, so, so let's talk about, you know, how, how does this happen? How does the government of the United States get away with doing certain things? You know, what, how are they able to do these sorts of things that are so horrific? Um, you know, we have this massive PR, public relations, um, that's conducted through independent business, that's conducted by our own government, the CIA. The CIA is, in many ways, a public relations branch where they create stories, they try to manipulate the, the public's mind. Um, I spoke with uh, Phyllis Bennis, and she talked about how... Um, how, how our government is able to manipulate the public and what sorts of things they say and ideas they uh, put out there. And it's important for us to understand this. If you're already educated and you think you understand these concepts, I think you need to hear about the specific ways that this is happening so that you can talk to other people to, to show them, okay, when they say this, this isn't actually true. When you can see the sorts of ways that uh, the public is being manipulated. So let's check out this clip. There's a huge set of legal issues that emerge around U.S. law. The U.S. Constitution says that only the president has the right to uh, go to war uh, and to, to determine war and to, to declare war. And so the way they've always gotten around it is they don't declare war at all. They go to police action in, uh, in Korea. Vietnam was a, an operation, the, a conflict. It wasn't a war. So none of these are considered wars. The, the smaller scale Cold War proxy wars of the 1980s in Central America, in Afghanistan at the time, in Angola, in Mozambique, in Nicaragua, in El Salvador, these were called operations of various sorts. They were small scale uh, and they were not acknowledged as wars either. So that's always been the way out. Phyllis Bennis. Uh, she works at the Institute for Policy Studies in Washington, D.C., also a great author. If you're looking for some information to help you understand certain things, uh, she wrote a great book on ISIS, and uh, if you're looking to learn more about ISIS or 
many other political conflicts. She's written a, a number of great books about those. Um, so we're getting some comments that I'll address for, on Facebook. But you know what our government does. Uh, you know most most of our wars and violent actions of the United States. They're not officially declared. There's no representation. There's no accountability. It, our Constitution of the United States uh, requires our our Congress, our you know our representatives, to get together and vote and agree to go to war. That doesn't happen anymore. What we see, like Phyllis was talking about are these uh, operations. They just, they do war. They create war, they just don't call it that. And they're able to get away with it. Uh, they've got huge teams of lawyers that are able to craft things to justify these uh, operations. And, you know, like I was saying, there's so many different conflicts that, you know, that we don't even know about. Check out the United States involvement in Nicaragua, uh, the Philippines. You know, a lot of these very small, much more smaller scale wars and operations, ass assassinations, coup attempts um, that, that don't ever get officially uh, consulted on by our Congress, our representatives, and that don't even get uh, mentioned in the public atmosphere. I don't think many people even know about a lot of these, these actions that happen. I don't think many people know about what happened in Haiti, you know, that President Clinton mentioned. Um, so here's a comment we have from Mary on Facebook. The USA has helped some countries like Japan, South Korea, and Germany to become financially ahead, but we don't see this in Islamic countries. Well, I, I don't, that's a, I'm not sure if I agree completely with that statement. Um, I think the United States has done a lot to uh, subvert uh, the welfare of those countries. Uh, a friend of mine uh, who's also a peace activist is uh, working on a campaign uh, in Japan to remove the United States military presence, uh, to remove the United States uh, influence of Japan. You know, right now we're currently using Japan as a military base. We have many bases in Japan. We use them as a strategic uh, point of interest uh, for global control, global domination. And, uh, uh, you know, unfortunately, Oh, okay, so countries like this, you know, they, they've uh, succumbed to United States pressure, uh, they've succumbed to United States influence. These countries, South Korea, Japan, Germany, um, the economies are all also capitalist economies opened up to uh, the, the source of business that the United States wants to have happen. Um, if, you, if, you're, if you ever don't understand why certain things are happening, it's, it's about money. It's always about money. Just follow where the money's going, you'll, you'll understand more. Uh, let's see, uh, this Mr. Meyer wrote back another comment. Please. Afghanistan needs quick money, but they can't do this through trades and technology since Afghanistan is much behind other competing countries. Right. The only way to improve the economy is to exploit mines and legalize and regulate some drugs. Okay, gotcha. And train more fighters since Afghans know a lot about fighting so they can be hired as security personnel by wealthy countries. Well, I wouldn't recommend that Afghans uh, enlist themselves to be mercenaries. I don't, I don't believe that being a mercenary or being used as a pawn in somebody else's uh, war is a, is, a, is a thing that you would want to do. But I do see uh, and agree with some of his other points about using the resources. And yeah, Afghanistan has a lot of natural resources. Uh, something that we'll talk about uh, in the coming weeks is... Uh, uh, the history of Afghanistan, before so, so much of uh, this warfare and bloodshed, Afghanistan was a, a prospering nation. It was developing. Uh, there was a lot more freedoms than you even see today. Uh, the economy was uh, moving upwards. Um, and uh, it, it's really a shame that this, uh, this nation has just been completely devastated. And the resources are there. Of course, minerals, like this, this gentleman is saying. But right now, those minerals are going to be used and abused by uh, foreign entities, businesses, countries. It's not going to go towards the benefit of this, uh, this country or the benefit of Afghanistan, unfortunately. Like I was saying, until this, until the, uh, this large power structure in Afghanistan and the United States changes, I don't think you're going to see the sorts of results that we want to see. It's just, it's just not going to happen. Mr. Meyer also writes, I think Afghans should be should should swing citing powerful countries to take advantage of regardless of which power is good and which is bad. 
So I think he's saying it should be aligned with powerful countries, regardless of which is good and which is bad. Well, like I was saying, I think uh, Afghanistan has the resources to be an independent nation, to open trade with countries that don't want to hurt its uh, national interest. Um, so we'll just talk about a couple other points before we close out here. If you have any other questions, feel free to write on Facebook or call in. Um, but you know, when you look at the history of the United States, which is my main point that we need to understand, it's not really hard to understand uh, that that our government and the elites that uh, have a lot of power in this country are not operating for the best interest of this country or the best interest of other people's countries. I mean, you look at the start. You know, this country was founded with slavery. Um, so for a lot of people that think that the United States was uh, built as a free nation, it's just simply not true. And I take no pleasure in saying that. It doesn't make me feel good to say that. I wish it weren't true, but that's the unfortunate truth. But, you know, that doesn't make me any less proud of a person. I still feel like, you know, there's a lot of great people that make up this country. And unfortunately, it's spoiled by a very select few people that have the money and have the power, manipulate our government, put these people in power to do their bidding and not the wishes of the American people. Um, and, you know, as we've seen from some of my interviews and uh, the work that they've done, there's been a number of horrible, horrible things that have been perpetrated under the United States using its military. It's the reason why we had Al-Qaeda attack this country. It's the reason why some of these terrorist organizations are created. They're not created from nothing. They're not created because there's just a bunch of insane people. They're created based on real reasons, based on real tragedies that happen to themselves, their families, their brothers, their countries. That's why this is happening. Um, so Americans really need to understand this, take ownership of it, and make a change, or we're never going to see any peace. Um, and I think, you know, uh, the true irony of this is, you know, <laughs> we saw a, a, a couple of uh, presidents say that terrorists hate freedom. The, the real irony is it's our government that hates the freedom of other people. We don't want to see people free to decide that they want a communist uh, country, that they want to socialize their natural resources. We don't want that. We want countries to behave in, in ways that are beneficial to American capitalism. So we don't want freedom for other countries. Anytime uh, a country elects somebody that we don't like, many times the United States has overthrown those leaders. So we don't want, when I say we, elite businessmen do not want freedom in countries. They want things controlled. Americans do want freedom. And unfortunately, we've been told lies about who's free, who's not. But the truth is out there. The information is out there. It's not hard to understand once you see it. But unfortunately, uh, the American media is uh, owned by a select few companies that don't give us that truth. Because if they give us the truth, then they're not going to get the access they need. They're not going to get the, the support of our government, which is where they get all their news stories from. They're going to be cut off. So they, I don't... There's you know this debating idea of whether our media is uh, evil or whether it's just a kind of necessity, and I, I think it's probably a mixture of the two. I think you know a lot of the media companies are owned by elite businessmen that do benefit from war and tragedy, and it boosts their ratings. But you know they also uh, benefit from the exposure they get with our government by saying positive things. So I'm gonna close out here. Uh, I thank you for tuning in. I'll be back next week. I think we're going to have some schedule shifting with some of our television shows um, due to some construction here by the studio. Um, check out my website, chrismileymedia.com. See some clips from my film on Afghanistan. Check out the entire short documentary, Disneyland of War. And um, if you have uh, any questions, you can also email me. Uh, my email is listed on the website. I want to thank Sajia uh, for all the work she's doing here at Afghanistan TV, Dr. Kamrani for his show. It was a great show. Ahmad Shah will be back next time. Uh, thank you for watching.